Today, we're going on an unplanned and totally unscripted visit to a park that I just found today. In Southeast Michigan, we're approaching peak autumn colors. And I was driving around today looking for sites to photograph, and I came across a local park that I never even knew existed. There's obviously a small lake or pond right here behind me. There's a number of trees and other interesting elements. I've actually set up my camera. I'm doing one photograph right now. And we're just gonna walk together and we're gonna see what we find. We're set up with a 55 to 200 millimeter Fujifilm lens. I saw this tree leaning over the water and I thought it made an interesting element. I'm cropped in a little bit to bring the image in a little closer. I'm also using a larger aperture on this in order to kind of focus more just on the tree and have the background, those birch trees and the colors drop a little bit out of focus. One of my main points of interest in this are the reflections on the water. So my settings, as you can see, my aperture is 4.4. I'm at a 30th of a second shutter speed, and I do have a circular polarizer filter on the lens. I'm gonna trust my intuition. I'm gonna take a deeper breath. I'm gonna think about how something There's a path that circles this pond, and that's what we're doing is we're just walking the path around the pond to see what we can find that looks interesting to photograph. This path, actually, in this tree, is the tree that we just photographed. In an earlier video, we discussed the polarizing filter and the effect it had on water reflections. I'm going to set up a split screen on this and show you what the polarizer filter actually does for water reflections. This is an excellent, excellent example. As we look through this, all we see pretty much is the reflection on the water. We can't see into the water. We can't see the colors of those leaves. But let's rotate that filter and look at that. Look at how much that comes out. Right? It's almost like there's no water there whatsoever. I go back. You can see those reflections come right back and I can I can dial that in to the exact amount of reflection that I want in my photograph. Most of you are quite clever, and I'm sure you picked up in an earlier vlog when I was discussing Fujifilm's film simulations built into their cameras. And I mentioned that I was using Superior, but if you look, there is no Superior simulation in the Fujifilm. One thing that I do, and a lot of Fujifilm shooters do, is we have recipes that we put into the camera. We can program them in with different film simulations, and there's a number of people that have figured out a number of these film simulations. The Superior is actually one that I've programmed and named into my camera. 
and I really like it for fall and for the autumnal colors. It just really makes them pop. Again, it's just a little bit of data that comes along with that raw file into Capture One. I still have the entire raw image, but also the beauty of working with the Fujifilm system and Capture One is it carries along any film simulations that you might have had kind of as a starting point. Many photographers find Fujifilm's simulations so good that they just shoot JPEGs. They don't even shoot raw files. That's amazing. I've done that before too. I've taken that, um, I believe, a little bit of a chance and done that and have never been disappointed in the results. One of the things that makes woodland photography so challenging is trying to find angles, leading lines, and your light to provide the three-dimensionality. Today is an incredibly dead, flat light day, no real contrast at all. So what we need to find is we need to find somewhere where the tree canopy is providing a tunnel of light to provide some shape to our subject. And I think I found that right over here. So what I have found is this little stump from a fallen tree that the moss has started to overtake. We have definitely have a direction of light that's coming from behind, giving us some highlights and shadows. And I can play with that a little more in post-production. I also like that we have a juxtaposition of the bright green of the moss that's overtaking this stump and the brown of the leaves behind. So let's set up and do our shot. Well, obviously we're set up a little different for this shot. I've dug out one of my adapted vintage lenses. This is actually off a projector, off a slide projector. It's the Leitz Wetzler company from Germany, and this is the Dimeron lens. It's an f2.8 lens, 100 millimeters. That'd be on the, the crop sensor, this is equivalent to a 35 millimeter, 150 millimeter lens. This lens has a very unique rendering. It is not tack sharp, but it definitely gives just a beautiful three-dimensionality to the image. One of the challenges I had was throwing the background out of focus. This gives me an f2.8, so which helps me lock, drop that background out of focus. And also the 100 millimeter, I backed up a little bit. I was trying to work with the standard Fujifilm lens to be at 55 millimeters, but f4, it just wasn't cutting it. Let me put my glasses on and look at what our settings are. Obviously, f2.8 is the only aperture that I have, but uh, the camera's got a 20th of a second and ISO 200. I, I really enjoy keeping the ISO down as low as possible, and 200 is the base ISO of the Fujifilm X System cameras. Contrast is what makes life interesting. Fire, ice, hot, cold, yin, yang, male, female, red, and green. The moss was so green in the stump, I felt it'd be a good contrast to place a couple of red leaves onto this, provide a little pop of color. We can play with that a little bit in post-production as well. Um, let me know if you're an absolute purist and you think that scenes need to be left as we come across them, or if you think it's okay when we do landscape or woodland photography to move things around a little bit as we see fit or we think they should be. Maybe because my formative photography years were spent doing portraiture, I have no issue moving things around to make the image right for what I think is right in my frame. If somebody came in wearing a necktie and it was crooked, of course I would straighten the necktie before taking the photograph. Wrinkles you straighten, stray hairs. To me, this is no different than any of that. It's making your photograph, the scene that you see, look the best it can. It's creating the vision in the camera on the sensor that you see with your eyes and with your brain. All things considered, and with our brief time together today, 
I think we had a pretty successful day of photography. We were able to create a couple of images, demonstrate the polarizing filter and its effect on water and reflections, and talk about light and some three-dimensionality, plus a little bit of information about contrast of color. If you like these teachings, if you like these vlogs, please consider subscribing. I'll run that right across the bottom right now. And remember, once you subscribe, you have to click the notifications. That's the bell with the quotes around it or tries to indicate that it's ringing. Then you'll know every week when we post a new video. As always, thanks for coming along and I really appreciate you being here with me today. Bye.